Alright guys, welcome back to my second devlog. This time I'm using my game Aero Blaster for the background. It's a game I made in 48 hours for a game jam a few months back. So continuing off of the last devlog, I mentioned that I did a stream and I only covered what I did in part of the stream where I just threw some assets. In the second half, I just did the basic implementation where I rendered those assets, added physics, and a basic player I could control and move around. But it was just a white box. And at that point, I ended the stream. So later on, I went and added a character, which I've been awful at drawing characters for a long time. I've only drawn like really small characters that are like a few pixels tall and stuff like that. That. and just in general I'm horrible at drawing people too but I went and uh, faced that fear and tried to draw something and it actually turned out pretty well in my opinion and I think I can do it again so I could draw more characters like this and once I had that character design in general I went and animated it I added an idle animation a running animation kind of a jump animation it's like a frame for the jump and then an animation for the fall but it's only like a couple frames and then the big one here is I added a landing animation I had no idea how much of an impact this would have. For some reason, it just makes the game so much better when you see that reaction that the character has when you land after dropping a decent distance. It helps a lot in making that character feel more real. So after that, I went and added some ramps, which needed some custom physics written for that. I actually did a video on that. And then I also went and made the drop through platforms actually drop through platforms. Before, they were just like solid tiles and you couldn't really pass through them. I, I set up the drop through platform Form, so I can just press down and drop through them and I can jump up through them. The physics for that's pretty simple. You just handle collisions from one side and then make sure that you're actually coming from on top of the tile so that you don't just jump up through it and then start falling back down and get teleported to the top. So here's where the fun stuff comes in. After that I started working on some grass. Grass was fun. So basically what I had was a few grass images. They're actually pretty big. The reason why my grass images look like this is because I was too lazy to go and do the math to make them not like this. The idea here is that the center of the image is the base of the grass. This means that if I rotate the image around its center, I'm rotating the grass at its base. I really should have done the math for this and I probably will go back and redo it so that I'm just doing this with math instead of a really big image so I can get more performance out of it. But this idea works. So I have these grass tiles in my level editor and when I load them in my game, I cut them out of the maps data and then add them into their own category of data that gets processed separately. My intentions were that the grass could be blown by wind and interacted with by the player. So the first thing I added was the ability for the player to interact with it. This is a pretty simple thing to do actually. All you have to do is make the grass bend away from the player when the player gets close. And the bending away is just rotating it because rotating it is bending it at the base of the grass, essentially. So all I have to do is check which side of the grass the player's on, and depending on how far away the grass is, I'll bend it a certain amount. So if the grass is really close to the player, I'll bend it really far. And the bending actually kind of has its own animation. I use a system where I take the distance from the target angle and then move it that amount towards that target angle divided by a certain amount. So basically as it gets closer to its target angle it starts slowing down. It creates a kind of smooth effect. And this also ends up looking okay when the target angle switches rapidly from like 70 degrees to negative 70 degrees when the player switches the side of the grass that it's on. Next up was the wind interaction with the grass. This was fun. So I added basically a representation Representation of wind in my data. The wind is just three different values for each gust of wind, which are spawned randomly, and they always go to the left. So the first value is the left edge of the gust, the second value is the right edge of the gust, and then the third value is the speed of the gust, so how fast it's moving to the left. And I can just update those so they just go to the left over time and remove them when they go far enough left. So it's just kind of a section of the game world that it's listing, and I can check and see if stuff is in that section. It's just two coordinates. I only have to think about the x-axis on this. So all I have to do here is for my grass check if it's inside those wind gusts and if it is I can just adjust the angle of the grass accordingly and in my case I adjusted it based on the speed of the wind too. So if the wind's blowing harder I change that angle even more. Although just grass kind of bending over when the wind is blowing doesn't quite look natural. So what I did here was 
I wanted it to wave and I added a sine wave to this. The sine wave just uses time and I, pa like I pass time into that sine wave and the sine wave affects the angle of the grass. The grass just kind of waves back and forth a little bit from that sine wave I added in. It was at this point I started realizing that my performance wasn't great with the grass, especially when you've got like hundreds of them on the screen and it's all trying to collide with the player and do all these calculations, especially with the wind and stuff. So I added some optimization. First of all, I made sure that the collisions were optimized. So what I did here was just kind of a pseudo hash map type thing. Well, it's a hash map, but it's kind of like what I did for chunks, except not. I separated the grass by the X coordinate of the tile it would have been on if it were a tile. And then when I test for collisions with the player, I just check if there's any grass in what would be the bordering tiles of where the player is and where the player is itself. So I only have to check three X coordinates on in my list of X coordinates to check for, for grass at. As for the wind, there's not much I can do there because it does have to affect all of the grass. What I did though, is I made sure that I only processed the grass that was on the screen. That's about all I could do there. Um, well, there's more I could do, but I'm not going to touch that for now, especially not until I've corrected that grass image I'm using that's massive. There's one last thing I wanted to do with this grass that I actually just had an idea to do while I was working on it. I wanted to make it so that if the grass is behind an object, it doesn't get blown as hard by the wind. So that actually wasn't a hard thing to do, since grass itself doesn't move around other than like I guess when the scroll moves which I can just disregard but generally since grass doesn't move around relative to the terrain all I have to do is check once at the beginning of the load of the map and look for bordering tiles and then I can calculate how much the wind should affect it because the wind's always coming from the right anyways so what I had to do was just go a certain amount of tiles to the right and just look, check that whole range to see if there's any tiles and depending how close the nearest tile is directly to the right I'll apply a specific wind modifier. It's just a value that the wind speed is multiplied by to get an angle for the grass. So the nearer the block to the right, the less the wind blows it. That was a pretty simple thing to achieve. It doesn't do too much in terms of things that are noticeable, but it's definitely nice to have. So next up, I took on the challenging part of adding water. Fortunately for me, I had already been messing around with water a few days beforehand, and I actually posted this on my Twitter. It's not too hard to do. I, I actually guessed how to implement this. I have to think about it is the fact that water goes up and down, kind of, and that it spreads around. The wave pattern just kind of spreads around. So the algorithm itself is just modifying all of the values to move towards the other values, kind of so it levels out. And then other than that, you just kind of give the water velocity and then shift that velocity towards the opposite direction when it's too far away from what would be level water. So it just kind of bounces up and down and then it spreads around too. Uh, an interesting issue I had here though was that my water would just freak out and go crazy if I tried to make it spread too fast. I knew I could make it spread faster by just doing more iterations of the spreading algorithm, but I didn't think that was the best way to do it. So I went and looked it up online and it turns out this is actually a thing where there's inaccuracies because of the incremental calculations I'm doing because this is somewhat physical calculations and those inaccuracies can cause some serious problems. So I just ended up having to settle for doing more iterations over the spreading calculations. Rendering the water itself was also an interesting story. Each unit of water has to be able to spread like within all of the bordering water tiles. So when I load the map, I look for all of the water tiles and try to find all the bordering water tiles and group them up. So I have these groups of water surfaces instead of individual water tiles. So I can treat those water surfaces as groups. Next up, rendering was an issue. You'd think I could just render a polygon for the water, which is kind of what I did, but I wanted to make sure that you could actually see through the water to some extent. So basically I generated a surface and then rendered the polygon onto it because in Pygame, when you render a polygon, like as a shape, you cannot apply an alpha. 
So I rendered that polygon onto its own surface, and then I set that surface as co-op key to black, so it's just that polygon I rendered, basically. And then I set the alpha to a different value, so it could be partially transparent. And then on top of that, I had to draw another white line to indicate the surface of the water. Other than that, I kept the original water tiles I used for anything that's below the surface, because the waves don't go that far down. And for those ones, I just could use a normal transparency setting on that. So now I'm at the point where I can jump around and make the water splash. Well, not quite splash, but wave around a bit. So after I finished the water, my next goals were just to start working on the environment a little bit more instead of just specific visual mechanics, because those were the big visual mechanics I wanted here. So the next thing I added was a parallax background just to kind of indicate the below ground level stuff. I do intend to do more parallax background stuff later on, I just haven't done the artwork for it yet. Other than the extra backgrounds I plan on working on, I also plan on working tree on trees and other foliage and particles. That's going to be a big one. That actually had a huge impact on Drawn Out an Abyss when I added those and hopefully they'll look great here. And I actually do intend to do some physics particles too with some stuff which will be very interesting. Anyways that's pretty much it for this video. If you're interested in my projects you can check out my Twitter and if you have any questions for me or you just want to join a kind of Python Pygame game development community uh, you can check out my Discord server. Hopefully I'll see you guys in the next video.